All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, and I am here with my wonderful coworker, Chelsea. Yeah. And we are here to talk about sibling relationships with a special shout out to Madison for her help uh, with this PowerPoint that we have for you today. So first thing first, I need to move my slide over one. There we go, got it. <laughs> so with Zoom, we, as you can just see, would ask that uh, we find patience because technology is weird sometimes and there's some challenges there are gonna be questions that we ask you guys in a poll setting. We really encourage your participation um, with those because we love data and we love seeing more about you all who are participating. And just know that at any point, there might be some unforeseen difficulties that we appreciate, again, your patience with us. So before we go on, um, I want to talk about how, oops, not yet. Don't listen to that, Chelsea. <laughs> how we can ask a question, how to answer a poll, and so on and so forth. So first of all, how to ask a question. If you look in the bottom part of your Zoom call, there is a comment section. If at any point you have a question, you can just hop, click that open, and then you can just type your question out. Chelsea is gonna be monitoring those um, comments for us, and then how to answer a poll. When it's time for a poll to pop up, it will pop up on your screen. You'll just click whatever option best suits you, and then you can submit it through clicking the button submit, and then it's given to Chelsea, and that information is passed on to us. It's all anonymous. We don't know who answered specifically. We do know how many people answered, but we don't know who it came from. So that poll will be also a part of our conversation today. And just so you know, you will be muted and your video is gonna be turned off during the duration of this series, this PowerPoint presentation today. Um, that is just to protect everyone's identification and to make sure that any outside noise isn't coming in onto the call um, that could be distracting or make it hard for other people to hear the content given. And then lastly, this is going to be recorded. The reason we're recording this is that this time may not work for everyone that we serve in our community and that's okay. We just wanna make sure that it's available to the people that would maybe benefit from the content presented. So it's being recorded. It will be available on the YouTube um, site associated with HealthWest Virtual Groups. That can be found at HealthWest, um, the HealthWest website. And then if you actually Google HealthWest Groups, there is an option to look at the virtual groups and the link to all of the presentations during the series are on that site. So first and foremost, we would like to find out who has joined us today. Oh, here we go. Again, we don't know who's answering which specifically, but we're just looking at um, how many, who the answers. That question, that statement didn't make any sense, but that's okay. <laughs> it made sense, we got it. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, we can probably end the poll because it looks like everyone participated. Great. So we have some parents. We have a parent here. We have some professionals here. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us. Um, yeah. So I'm going to exit out that. And then the next question we have is how many kids do you care for? This kind of gives us an indication. This, this content is related specifically to siblings. Um, and so we just kind of want to get a vibe as to how many kids uh, are being represented in the sibling nature of this. So we have one parent and it looks like one person answered a question, which is awesome. Um, yeah, I 
think we can end it. It looks yeah, like I think other we can end it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Two kids. Yes. That would mean there's parents here that have children who have siblings, which is great. And, you know, a part of this, that was really helpful to know too, because a part of it as well is to know how we can assist as a professional um, parents who have children with siblings. So just some housekeeping things right out the gate. Let's talk about what type of sibling relationships we're talking about when we're talking about this. <laughs> I was going to say sibling like five more times, but then I realized how redundant that was. So um, we have step, half, biological, foster, adopted, non-familial. Is that how I say that? I like the way you said it. It had a good energy to it. <laughs> um, that's definitely not how you say it. That's okay. It sounded good. Thank you. Thank you. So we have all these different types of sibling relationships that we may have in our own life, that we may have in the parents' lives of who we work with. And those are the type of relationships that we're looking at when we're dealing with this content. Sorry, I'm just figuring that out. So caregivers, biological, foster, step, adopted. <laughs> Non-familial? I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm I feel like, yeah, so it's just like caregivers that may not be by blood or may have, maybe it's your, your biological mom's best friend or something like that. Mm -hmm. Some sort of person in your life that you deem very important to you um, or very important to a caregiver. However, there's no necessary genealogy connected to that person in relation to the kids being served or your own kids. Yeah. And I think one thing that is, is very true to the world we live in now, um, even though there are so many different options for how we label caregivers and the different sibling relationships, um, we didn't touch on all of them and there may be things that or phrases that you use that are different that doesn't mean that um, they're not equally as important or that um, maybe they're not considered family just like Elizabeth said um, our families are made up of so d many different individuals it could be a best friend it could be um, a grandmother or whatever so just keep in mind that um, for those individuals that we work with and also for our own families it can look really different yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good point. And it's, and like this slide says, you know, it's, it's okay that every, every family looks different. And that is just how our world is represented in a lot of ways. So that is good. And also good to know too, when we are working with our families as professionals, thinking about the constructs of the family system and how it is related to one another so that we can best serve those um relationships so when we're talking today about siblings this is kind of our frame of reference of what we're going off of siblings need a coach not a referee they did not choose they did not choose one another that says did but they didn't choose one another so that's we're just trying to point out the fact that they didn't choose one another <laughs> exactly exactly and they are forever friends so these are our kinds of things that we're looking at when we're thinking about our frame of reference for this um, content today. Are there any questions so far, Chelsea, from the thing or anything that needs to be brought up? No questions at this point in the chat, but um, you know, some encouraging things about participating. So we, we appreciate our, our viewers participating. Thank you. Absolutely. So what are the common concerns when we're talking about siblings and siblings relationships? First thing that we think of is communication. How do siblings talk to one another? And again, our frame of reference is they need that coach. They need that person to help them cross that communication bridge together because sometimes siblings by themselves may not have the tools to be able to communicate well. I personally work with children with autism, specifically under the age of 21. Chelsea works with a wide range of youth um, with developmental disabilities herself. 
And so sometimes with the kids that we're serving, we really have to make sure, do they have the prerequisite skills in communication? What is the breakdown here? What skills could possibly be needed to be trained in order for that bridge, that communication br bridge to be crossed by both parties? That's a super important check-in for us as professionals and as parents too, you know, there is this coach, this kind of, um, this need this to come alongside your child to the best of your ability to kind of see things from their perspective and where they're coming from to help kind of mediate that conversation as they're learning to do that themselves you know kids aren't kids aren't born with conflict management strategies or abilities and it's part of our role as parents to help guide them through that process to help them see possibly different perspectives um, I know from speaking with children with autism, that perspective taking can be very difficult and has to be a skill taught to the two children, both neurotypical and children with developmental disabilities. And so it's really important to check in there and say, what are the skills that have to do with communication that may need to be built up? or strengthened or maybe utilized differently. Maybe your child has a great skill in communication, but it needs to be redirected in some way. You know, that may already be a strength that's just not utilized to its full capacity. And then this point says it right. They didn't choose one another. <laughs> Got it right. <laughs> yeah. And so then thinking about with siblings, you know, they have different personalities, they have different opinions. And you know, working together, I know as adults, it can be difficult sometimes to even accept other people's opinions when it comes to communicating with each other. And, you know, we have so many years of experience built up to this point that we've had opportunities to practice accepting other opinions different than ourselves. And some days it may still be a struggle. However, the children that we work with specifically may not have those skills they don't have those skills when they're born and they need to be coached through how to accept different opinions than their own. I mean, there's some very, you know, it takes opportunities, it takes time and we'll get to that more a little bit later. And communication, the siblings are gaining lifelong skills through communication and conflict. Conflict is a natural thing that happens in many in all relationships at one point or another, whether it's deemed as a minor conflict or a major conflict is in the eye of the beholder. However, it's going to happen. And the skills that we're teaching our kids or teaching the siblings that we work with are lifelong skills that they will continue to develop and grow over time. So I keep moving my mouse, but there we go. So as parents, the language that we use is so important and can have an impact, whether it's positive or negative, on the relationships our children have with each other. How we use our language to communicate our needs and wants, how we um, use that positive language to model to them, how we expect them to communicate with one another is one of the first steps that we want to look at. As professionals, you know, we spend time in, with parents on one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's in a family training session or a parent coaching session, helping redirect certain phrases or praising when um, parents utilize positive techniques. We're that professional that comes alongside the parents to be that reinforcing agent to them and really help them know that, hey, at the base by seeking out assistance and seeking out services, you're already doing amazing things as a parent and wanting to get assistance and skills for your kids. So when they are using the language that is positive and um, redirecting and show and modeling sometimes if needed, that positive language for parents can be really um, a good thing as a professional as well. So. When it comes to communication, there's also expectations. So with siblings, we want to explain the expectations to our children. We want to tell them what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, if visual charts of expectations are needed or to help the child stay on task. That may be something that we want to introduce to um, 
our kids. I remember growing up, I have a sister um, and we were relentless about the remote control and watching TV. Oh my goodness. Like the TV was Grand Central Station at the Wing household. Wing's my maiden name. And so the expectation was, is that we would share. That was mom's expectation of us. However, we needed a visual to remind us of that sharing. So on the calendar, my mom wrote a J and an E every other day to indicate to us whose day it was to have full remote control. control. <laughs> and I remember as a kid, that was the expectation. They're running to the kitchen and looking at the calendar and being like, yes, it's E's day, you know? And <laughs> that little visual really helped communicate those expectations for my sister and I, and not saying that will work for every child. However, sometimes we need to add that element of visualization for our children to assist with understanding the concept. And then also when it is a challenging situation to remind them that there are expectations, but it has to be at the appropriate time. As professionals, you know, we work with parents that we will need to, you know, coach through really tough situations that the communication expectation, you know, there's something happening there that the child needs some redirection, needs to be debriefed is what the language that I use a lot. However, the the expectation still needs to be followed through first and then afterwards at the appropriate time when maybe the siblings are de-escalated because maybe the communication, the bridge just couldn't be crossed and there was just a lot of elevation, a lot of, you know, um, increase in emotions and whatnot. And at the appropriate time when maybe there's some de-escalation, there's some regulation there, that would be the appropriate time to talk about the the expectations once they're already followed through and there's that chill time. So it is also important to stay patient with our children. So, and if there is needed that coaching, the prompting to help follow through. So that may come when they're building those skills of crossing that communication bridge together. They may need that coach coming alongside them to say, you know, ask her how she, what she wants or something like that and then that also comes from a professional standpoint too i mean coming alongside our kids you know i think about like interverbal programs and then fading ourselves out of the picture so that the child becomes more socially responsible for their own behavior and then over time it just becomes second nature to them because we've faded ourselves out much like parents you know stepping back small steps by small steps so that the children over time and through a lot of opportunities can gain the skills in order to learn how to communicate somewhat effectively. And just to touch real quick too, because um, we're discussing language and expectations and having patience. Um, you know, Elizabeth, while you were talking, something popped in my head and it's something that, you know, as professionals and as family members, we have to remind ourselves that sometimes good communication is listening and not talking and oftentimes children who do have that ability to at least verbally express themselves they just want to be heard and so if there is a conflict between siblings um, it's important to you know when appropriate make sure of course address safety first but um, give them an opportunity in a healthy way again set those expectations of how to express themselves and then for us as parents to stop talking for a moment and listen. And oftentimes we can get to the root of those problems if you just take a moment to pause and realize, okay, I have to keep my mouth shut, which is something, you know, I often have to remind myself because when there's a conflict, we want to help and we want to resolve it. But sometimes the best thing to do is just to listen. Yeah, that's a great point, Chelsea. I'm so glad that you brought that up because that is absolutely true. A great skill for everyone to have. Yeah. So with communication with children with different abilities, it's important to, you know, when I was doing a lot of research about sibling relationships, something that kept coming up again and again is children with siblings who have, um, children with siblings with developmental disabilities or different abilities um, often feel very lonely in their experience as a sibling. 
Um, and I think that's important to just be aware of and just to tap into to communicate with the child to make sure that siblings, both set of siblings, both siblings in that set have the ability to communicate, you know, their emotions, where they are in that zone, and the ability to um, talk about, you know, how they're feeling, what's going on with them. And I think it's important not just to assume that a neurotypical child has the ability to self-regulate. And it's important to not assume that that child has the skill set to articulate emotions that comes with time, that comes with opportunities and experiences. And I think it's important for uh, kids to check in on all that level with their caregiver, with their coach, to kind of see where they're at. Um, and then also with siblings, you know, finding ways so that siblings can communicate with one another, involving the sibling in the treatment plan, in the treatment of the child to say, hey, we're going to do a picture exchange communication system with this kiddo. And when it comes to training the family about how to utilize that um, technique, you know, involving the siblings so that exchanges of that picture can be generalized not only across staff, but across caregivers and across um, the siblings as well. So with any sort of communication involving the siblings to be a part of that experience can really, really help unite the siblings together. And um, that can also be an idea to pass along. Ah, my arrow works without me having to push it every time on the PowerPoint. <laughs> questions? There are no questions in the okay. comments section. I'm going to keep going. So behaviors. Now, I'm a BCBA, also um, LPC. So this, this is really a large part of my wheelhouse is the behavior. So when we are assessing the conflict between um, children, we really want to pay attention to is, you know, what else is going on here behaviorally. And whenever there is a behavior problem between siblings, there, are, you know, also there's a skill set, this communication um, skill set that needs to be tapped into, but then also we need to look at the behavioral side of things. And first and foremost, I always want to go over what are, what is behavior? What behavior is anything someone does basically? And why do people engage in behavior? And there are, in my, in my mode of practice, there are four reasons why someone engages in behavior. And these lovely dogs have a lot more <laughs> to talk about with it. So we first have escape. So as this dog is lovingly hiding underneath the curtain, just kind of escaping. Once the, the event happens, let's say it's something, a task is given, maybe they're told they have to share with their sibling, maybe they're told that they have to go play with their sibling, the child may engage in behavior to, to escape behavior, my, I think my son just like threw like a thousand things down the steps. So sorry about that. I just <laughs> had a moment of what just happened in my house, but I'm here and I'm ready to go. So uh, <laughs> my husband's on it. Don't worry. He is Good. supervised. Okay. So um, the thing is, is that with escape, the behavior is, the behavior is escape. It's avoidance. I'm engaging in this behavior to avoid sharing with my sibling, to avoid, you know, going to play. So maybe I run away. Maybe I hide like this dog underneath the curtain. Um, another way that functional behavior is tangible, T. So like this dog is not so lovingly taking this toy from this other dog. You know, I am asked to share a toy with my sibling and maybe when I'm when I am prompted to share, I hit my sibling. And by hitting my sibling, I get access to that toy because maybe my sibling drops it. There, that could be a possible reason why the behavior occurs. So it's not, it's all, there's skills parts of why someone does something or does or doesn't do something, but there's also a behavioral piece that we need to look to as well. And then there's attention you know, to 
gain attention when I am told that I have to, um, sharing is just a big thing with siblings. So I keep going back to sharing because that's like my number one thing that I'm talked about as a professional with parents with siblings. So my kid doesn't share with their sister. He just doesn't share. That might be a common thing that I hear over and over again. And let's say when um, I am told to share with my sibling, I start yelling and I start screaming. And then my mom comes over from being in the kitchen and then scolds me. That may be reinforcing my screaming behavior because whether it's negative or positive attention, attention is attention. And by engaging in this behavior, it is giving me that attention that I'm longing for by engaging in this behavior. I call it feeding the function. How are we feeding that function? How are we, um, you know, continuing that function to grow and expand? There are ways that we want to make sure that we are attending to that function so that the behavior, especially if it's problematic, is decreasing. Now, if we see our child sharing and we know they have a lot of attention seeking behavior, we can proactively give that child a lot of attention so that they're, they're kind of being fed in a way that fills up a lot of positivity and they're able to increase that behavior because it's reinforcing to them. Um, the last behavior, function of behavior is sensory, which I love this dog. I mean, I just think it's so funny. Mm -hmm. But sensory behavior is doing something that um, you do because it feels enjoyable to you. You know, I, working with children with autism, it can be hard for parents and for siblings to know how to play with their sibling when their sibling who, who is diagnosed with autism may have a lot of sensory or self-stimulatory behavior, which leads to non-functional play with toys. So what I mean by that is like a kid is playing with a car and maybe they're playing with a car like they're flipping over the car and just spinning the wheels. Or they have a bubble machine and maybe they just put their face in the bubbles the whole time because it keeps going and going and not giving access to the other kids. Obviously, there's some um, bubble input solution, like some solution input there that we also want to attend to. But yeah, you, Chelsea, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool, cool. <laughs> I see you nodding. Like I'm looking at the corner of my screen because I'm just like talking to you. <laughs> but yes. So when we're looking at that's also something that we want to speak to too with um, teaching siblings how to play with one another, because there comes a point that like the sib, one of the siblings, one of the many or how many are, there are may not be able to play functionally with toys. So that might be something that we need to attend to too. You know, mm -hmm. it's the reason a child doesn't share well is because when that child gives over the toy to her sibling or his sibling that is diagnosed with autism, they do things with it that aren't functional for that toy. And it's upsetting to the sibling who just gave that toy, that might be something that we need to attend to too. Can this child even play functionally with toys and how can we build that skill set? Mm -hmm. So again, speaking to what are some challenging behaviors that we have um, between siblings, you know, playing, playing inappropriately, sharing, hitting, screaming, becoming upset when a toy or preferred object is taken away. You know, we want to look at what is the function of this behavior. We want to find a balance during playtime, um, you know, giving time to kids to not play with one another, not having it always have to be with one another is okay. You know, it's just about creating that balance. And when it is time to play with one another, really being intentional as parents to be that coach, to come alongside the kids, to really make sure that you're providing that guidance, especially in the beginning where they're going to need a lot of guidance. They're going to need a lot of coaching because that skill set, those opportunities haven't been there necessarily in this capacity before. Um, yeah. Ooh, give opportunities for practice of telling your child no. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, it's okay to tell your child no. It's good to build up that um, ability to be told to know, um, that's a lifelong skill. That's a lifelong skill. And so then I think it's, it's, it's important to 
create those opportunities to follow through with that when I always I always err on the side like follow through with what you know with what you know you're able to follow through with. And if you're going to say no and you know in the back of your mind that you don't have the emotional capacity, the physical capacity to actually follow through with that no, then don't even say it. <laughs> like it's okay to you have it's important it's more important for a follow through at that point because that's going to be more effective in teaching the skill yeah so, and I, oh i'm sorry no go ahead i was just going to say you know the important thing to know is that no matter what you know cognitive ability or um your child is at every behavior again serves that function and uh, no matter where they're at they know what they're going to get right and so sometimes I think that we can get hung up as parents saying, well, if I have a child who is cognitively impaired, well, they don't understand. And so we just let certain behaviors go, especially when they're with their siblings or interacting with other kids. Um, it's important that we still address those behaviors. It may seem easier right now to ignore certain things. Like if we're going to scream bloody murder in a supermarket, I don't want people to stare at me. I don't want people to think I'm hurting him, right? Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that if we don't address those behaviors now, um, they're only going to continue or they're going to get potentially worse. And so, um, yeah, that's just something I wanted to note because, I mean, even us as adults, um, going back and referencing saying no, how often do we like being told no, right? Right. And even sometimes we respond pretty, um, we can respond pretty explosively. And so it's important, like, we need to teach our kids. Um, and we need to address every behavior and touching on what Elizabeth said, that follow through is so important. So let's say your child, um, you are separated from your partner. And so your child spends some time at their house as well. If you say, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to take away that PlayStation that is at their other parent's house. If you have no ability to take away that PlayStation, you just kind of lost that credibility and that follow through. And so they know. I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm still going to get that PlayStation at dad's. And mm -hmm. so it's important with that follow through. Yeah. And I, I absolutely agree, Chelsea. Those are, those are excellent points <laughs> for sure. Um, as we move forward in this content, I think it's really important to remember those, those things with follow through and also talking about follow through, like how are reinforcing and, follow through with reinforcements, with consequences. The biggest thing that I want to spend time on this slide with when it comes in to relation with siblings is just those positive opposites. That phrase just is really, really important. And by positive opposites, what I mean is giving an instruction to your child that is clear, concise, simple, all those things that is opposite of what they're currently doing that so currently doing okay new sentence so what i mean by that is your kid is hanging a toy over their sibling's head and kind of taunting them with it a positive opposite is put that toy on the ground that tells the child what they can do with whatever thing they're engaging in that they could provi be provided reinforcement with so that would be an example of utilizing positive opposites as a parenting strategy, as a professional strategy when to address behavior. What may happen more times than not, um, just because it, it, it seems to be second nature is stop that, don't do that. Um, you know, things like those phrases may be feeding that function of attention in a negative way that um, may result in the increase in that taunting behavior because a child is receiving reinforcement for a behavior. Um, and it's even though it's not a behavior that we want to see because it has that function of attention um, and we're giving it negative attention, it's feeding that function and we're likely to continue to see that behavior increase um, if that child is desiring attention. Positive opposites just really set the stage for positive reinforcement because it gives a child, tells a child exactly what they can be doing with their bodies in the moment and 
say, you know, saying things like, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening and minding. I'm, I'm so happy when you, you know, play with your sibling. Those can all be reinforcement statements provided as a consequence strategy so that we can see an increase in the behavior that we want to see. This is especially, especially useful for children who have attention seeking behavior, um, especially for sure. Um, so another aspect of sibling relationships that we want to tap into today is modeling and modeling for our children as parents and then also in those professional roles um model i mean even as professionals in in meetings with parents you know we're utilizing those modeling techniques of the kind of communication and respect that we hope to gain in this relationship as well and so you know we we are modeling in the moment with the parents and then gently instructing directing redirecting if needed reinforcing of course the behavior that we would like to see in the moment now we have parents and professionals that may be like okay you can tell you can stop telling me that i'm doing a good job communicating with my kid and that's awesome to me if a parent says that to me that means that we're kind of like have rapport with one another <laughs> and that at least you know like you're telling me what's going on and it takes everything with me and be like thanks for telling me what you need because then i'm <laughs> doing exactly what he told me not to do. Um, but it's important to, to model for our parents, to model for our children, the kind of um, behavior that we expect from them. Saying please, yeah. saying thank you. Apologizing when a mistake is made. I mean, that can be very difficult as a parent to say, I'm sorry, even mm -hmm. to you know our own siblings. You know, I'm sorry, I messed up on that one. I messed up. I should not have, you know, done this or this. That can be a very powerful modeling technique, especially when we have siblings who you're like, say you're sorry. And they're like, mm -mm, you know, or they cross their arms or something like that modeling, you know, appropriate. I'm sorry. You know, and what that looks like can be a very, a very um, powerful tool for parents asking for forgiveness. You know, these are all things that, um, start with the parents and start there and um it can be really important as parents these kids these siblings again didn't choose one another they they didn't choose one another they're they're forever connected to one another um and so it's important that they have that coach that we remember that we're teaching them lifelong skills because they didn't get to come on to this you know say like I want that kid to be my sibling you know that didn't happen so um it's important for us to model those important interpersonal skills yeah and so. like you mentioned Elizabeth that sometimes um like when the parent says like you don't have to always compliment me for communicating well there on the flip side is that I've heard many times that why do I have to say certain things that should just come naturally why do I have to um, praise them for doing something that they should already be doing? And so it can feel um, maybe awkward at first. Like, why am I um, trying to think of an example? And, you know, in, in experience working in school, sometimes staff would say they're supposed to turn in their homework. Why do I give them praise for doing so? Um, but it's important to keep our, our, our sight on the future that eventually we won't have to do so many um, verbal praises or we don't have to do so many of these um, thank you or you did such a good job because we will have instilled that in them and building those skills and building that understanding of this is what I'm supposed to do with those expectations and so at first it may feel uncomfortable may feel a little awkward um, it's important to find that language that fits you best but just know that um, in the future you may not always have to thank your child for putting their dish in the sink or for other things that you can think of, but um, until that is a skill that they learn um, consistently, it's something that we just have to do, and, and it will become more comfortable over yeah. time, but it may just take time. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're really speaking to it. It is important over time to fade ourselves out because we want that the child playing on the playground isn't always going to get reinforced by their friend saying, thanks for playing with me. I mean, that'd be awesome, but that's just not the world we live in. So you're exactly right. I mean, it is important to help parents see those big pictures of this isn't for always, Mm -hmm. but as a reminder, you've had, you know, what helps me too is like reminding myself of my age, which I don't need to disclose, (laughs) but you know, I've had this many years to have opportunities to practice these skills. And I'm working with, let's say a two-year-old and a four-year-old and they've had two years earth side, four years earth side. And you're learning so much in such a small time frame that emotional regulation techniques, communication techniques are not just given, they're, they're taught over time. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to think about and definitely perspective um, as a caregiver, as a professional to be like, yeah, I mean, these, it's just different because I've had this many years to practice these skills and kiddos have not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, I know you've already stressed this, but, you know, apologizing, answering forgiveness can be very uncomfortable for adults to kind of wrap our head around um, because, in many situations, we feel like we need to re- keep and establish authority. And um, I think just like you said, it's that perspective. It's switching the perspective of, you know, asking for forgiveness and apologizing isn't a weakness. It's a strength. It promotes uh, healthier communication. And I know for me, whether someone has intentionally or unintentionally hurt my feelings, the feeling of when someone says, I'm sorry, whether they mean it or not is just it it is kind of a relief it's like oh they acknowledge how I feel and so when our siblings um, or when our children or if you're arguing with your sibling as an adult always remember that you know the end game is that we care about each other and that we want to continue this relationship and so sometimes it's acknowledging I may have hurt you wasn't my intention um and even if you're having that conflict with and another adult, if your children are present, you are again are modeling that behavior that they can learn that, okay, it's okay to say these things. Um, but I think that's so huge because oftentimes, like Elizabeth said, our, our kids have not been here for long, but we expect them to do things that sometimes we aren't even comfortable with doing. And so it's just changing that perspective. Yeah. And that takes time too. And that takes relationships yeah. with our parents that we work with mm-hmm. because that takes us building rapport and things like that as well. So these are all really excellent points. I'm just so happy to be here with all of you. Yes. Um, So around, you know, when we talk about sibling relationships, we're talking about opportunities. We're talking about giving them opportunities to build lifelong skills with people that they're going to be connected to their whole life. Whether they are physically with that person their whole life, as roommates or whatever, they're still going to be connected to this individual one way or another. So providing opportunities for them to engage with one another can be really helpful for, especially um, as I was reading like siblings with, um, children with siblings with developmental disabilities can often feel lonely. And if there's opportunities that we can engage for, uh, create for engagement around the house, um, or in their experiences with one another, that can really help bridge that um, bond and help the, both of the children to feel like I have a friend for life. Um, they may not always get along with one another and that's okay, but again, they're connected with one another, whether they like it or not, the rest of their life. Um, yeah, you would always want to hope for the best of siblings, but yeah, there are times that Later in life, they may not be as connected as they were when they were children, but as when they're in your home together, um, it's important as caregivers um, to create those opportunities for engagement. So helping around the house, you know, using those expectations and having it be consistent across both children. Um, when Chelsea and I were preparing, you know, this content today, we were really talking about how it is important to have your expectations for your siblings, for your kids to be united, to, to be 
the same, if not very, very similar, mm -hmm. because it can be, it can be frustrating to have one sibling who quote unquote gets away with everything. And then another sibling who's held to a, a higher standard or just the standard expectations, but yet a sibling who's not held to any expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to, if you do have some sort of task, maybe it is putting away the dishes um, for the siblings. And it is the expectation that both siblings would complete that chore, that both siblings would be held accountable to completing that chore. It may look different for one of the siblings over the other. Maybe one needs to, maybe they need to create, kind of create a train in a, in a sense of putting the, away the dishes, you know, helping each other, passing the dishes to one another, um, instead of one sitting on the sidelines, um, looking on, like just involving, engaging both children in the expectations can help just ease that conflict just out the gate because there isn't this sense of one child getting whatever they want. Um, yeah. I think to add to that, kids for the most part are very good at pointing out what is unfair. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I know I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not fair. Why do they always get that? Why can't I do that? And so I think it's important, you know, if, especially. I guess even if it does, if you don't have a child with a different ability, just for any child, expectations should be as similar as possible, but like Elizabeth said, they may be different. We may expect the child to put the dishes away, but our other child can only do half of that. So it's important when um, having different expectations to an extent, we need to express why. Um, so yeah. let's say Elizabeth and I are siblings and I have to clean the whole house and Elizabeth just has to clean her room. I'm going to think that's not fair. And so it's important as our make pretend parent to explain to me, you know what, you have this responsibility, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the reason is for why they are different. It's important to, because you don't want um, your children to have that resentment because I can still remember times as a kid, well, why did they always get away with that? And oftentimes it was because I was more go with the flow. I was more breezy. I would do whatever I was told. And so there was a lot of that resentment. Well, they get away with anything because they put up a fuss. Mm -hmm. And so again, those expectations, it's so important that they're clear and that it may take time um, for your children to understand why there may be different expectations. But again, that's where that patient comes in. Patience comes in. Yeah. And um, I think as we're talking about this, Chelsea, it's really bringing to light just how it's important again as a parent to or caregiver i i, I keep using the word parent but i mean caregiver as yeah, a caregiver yeah. to to check in with what are the actual realistic expectations that i can implement mm -hmm. because i mean i can really i mean i as a professional you know i can look at behavior i can attempt to break it down and understand patterns to come up with concepts of behavior change. As a personal person, I think about sibling relationships and just like there are those aspects of different personalities and, mm -hmm. and explaining the why is so important. As a parent, you know, I think it's important to, I am the, the oldest in my hierarchy so I have a younger sister and it could it was difficult sometimes growing up understanding why my sister maybe had was given access to things prior to me or at a, at an earlier age than I was let's say the cell phone or mm -hmm. access to transportation or even rules regarding transportation and you know I think it, it comes with you know as a parent your expectations also may change over time. As your house changes, maybe you have older siblings that leave the home or older children that leave the home and then you have a new kind of unit within the home that obviously the children that are no longer in there are not, they're still part of the unit, but the home construct has changed. So may the expectations. And I think it's just important all around, like you're saying, Chelsea, to communicate that why, to communicate and to check in as parents to be like, what am I expecting now? And with each age that our kids grow, I mean, my kid is a lot different than they were 
nine months ago Mm -hmm. (laughs) and or even between two and three years so much can happen so expectations may change and that's okay I think it's important as caregivers to check in with yourself to check in who with whoever you're raising these children with together to say hey where are we with our expectations have they changed are they the same I mean this doesn't have to be a formal family meeting with the kids but maybe with across caregivers you're checking in with one another talk about how are we modeling this this expectation how are we guiding and coaching our children that we're attempting to raise well (laughs) you know together um I think that's just the real part of it is that it's it may change and I I think the biggest thing that Chelsea you and I are trying to communicate is that that's okay and it's just important that whatever you're choosing to um have those expectations remembering that it's important for follow-through and yeah yeah, for sure oh I don't think there's anything changed in the comments nope no change in comments so benefits why are they why is it why are they so important it's important because as we said from the beginning, this is teaching lifelong skills to the kiddos to um, have them develop those management strategies for emotions, those social skills. Working with children with autism, um, social, social, social skills are not necessarily innate in their ability to talk with one another. So it's really important that, you know, opportunities for both, for both parties are just being developed and um, that those can continue to grow and expand over time. Yeah. Um, so moving on, I'm just going to keep moving here. Yes, we are, uh, within our nine minute marker. So, okay. Okay. We just want to be sensitive to everyone's time attending. So we're just going to keep going. The big picture. I mean, it's like this content is about siblings, but we can't talk about siblings without talking about the caregivers that provide for them. Yes. And it's really, really important that as we're talking about these children and the families that we as caregivers are checking in with ourselves too, to make sure that our self-care is there. Because again, our tank gets empty and mm-hmm. our ability to implement expectations can fall by the wayside when we ourselves are not at the capacity to implement those expectations. Maybe yesterday we need to check in and we need to model for our children. Hey, I'm really tired today. Um, These are how my expectations maybe are changed today. Now I'm not going to try to pretend that like, the, real, the reality is, is that we're not having those kind of conversations with our kids every day. Like, hey, mm-hmm. check in. I mean, that would be awesome modeling. And I think it's also important as a caregiver to check in with yourself to be like, where am I at? Um, so that I can make sure that if I do need it, if there's a major expectation change that relates to today, that maybe I need to tell that to my child that, hey, you know, I'm I'm really tired today and that's that's not going to be an expectation for today. Yeah. Um and then taking care of your modeling to your children, you know, emotional regulation um and taking care of yourself is a great way to decompress, to make sure that you're able to stay regulated to the best of your ability, to include your natural supports into this conversation. Let's not forget about them. You know, we, it takes a village too with raising kids. And that is absolutely 100% true. um, So that we can include the people that are important to our children, important to us when thinking about how we're caring for the whole unit um yeah one thing that i think of is so often even regardless of what our role is um and really whether or not we had children or not but the fact that we're talking about siblings so let's assume we do um so often we hear we even say like i don't have time to take care of myself i have a million one things to do and especially now that everyone is at home it's hard it it gets hard to take care of yourself and so um a little plug elizabeth and i did a presentation in the past um about coping skills 
And the thing that you can do um, is try to incorporate your children in those moments of self-care. And so, for example, if your self-care is you just want to listen to some music, of course, if it's age appropriate, and that's up to you to determine if it is age appropriate, but include your kids in that. Um, I like to paint. It's crazy painting, very abstract. Um, but I try to engage my family in that. Some of them are like, that's not what I want to do. And so it's, again, also respecting those boundaries. But we are here to raise a family. But if we're not um, taking care of ourselves, it, it's going to be harder. And mm -hmm. so it's important to make that time. And if you feel like you don't have time, especially with our kids being home from school, um, include them in it so that you all can learn healthy life skills for the future so it's just important I we know it's hard I mean there's so many times I think I just don't even want to put the effort to do something that would fill me back up um, but then I realize over a certain amount of time if I don't take that time I'm angrier I'm more likely to respond to situations more emotionally um, whereas if I take time to do something that me is meaningful to me I'm much more understanding and forgiving yeah yeah, absolutely. I think those are all really great points. And um, when we think about self-care, you know, we're thinking about all these things. We're thinking about self-care. We're thinking about our communication and expectations. I think the biggest thing is speaking to those natural supports of getting connected because especially with siblings, with children with developmental disabilities, it is important that everyone like that these siblings feel not alone and they're and parents you know there's plenty of um there are quite a few resources i listed them here in the county and these are as easy as finding over facebook and to get those notification of events that may be occurring um virtually or in the distant future regarding even communicating with other parents. I mean, this is just a great um, sounding board that is um, available. And then also, I'm just gonna keep going. These are some self-care resources. We have Calm, we have Headspace. Um, these are some great places. Again, this PowerPoint is gonna be on the YouTube site. Um, after this is all done because this is going to be recorded. So if you are seeking out these resources, this PowerPoint will be available via that YouTube video again soon. Um, and then we have the educational series. We're talking about daily living skills coming up. I am leading that one in a couple of weeks, um, talking about how to, to teach um, skills daily living skills, especially when our child may be afraid of that situation, i.e. hair washing or nail trimming or something like that. Toilet training is, we're going to be discussing that in a couple weeks. Um, let's see, I'm pretty sure we've done most of those. We have a few more. There's more. There's Monday, it's on Mondays and Wednesdays at 4 p.m., this Zoom link. Um, and then here are some references from our PowerPoint today. So yeah, I'm going to, so everyone, we are so thankful. Are there any last comments or questions? JLC, I don't think so. I don't think so, but you know, this is, this is something that, you know, because we work with youth, we're so geared to those younger kids, but these are skills that we can use. I can't even think of skills that I could probably use better with my own sibling relationships. And so, um, right? me too. Yeah. So feel free to, you know, check this out on YouTube if you're not attending now with us, but um, thank you so much for letting us present. Yeah. And everyone have a great day and enjoy the sunshine. Goodbye.